A little girl once asked her mother if the Bible story of Elijah flying to heaven on a chariot of fire was real or pretend. How would you have answered her question? You might try to explain that sometimes a pretend story can tell more truth and do more good than a real one, as Jesus' parables exemplify so powerfully. You might explain how real stories often are embellished with pretend elements. Or you might respond as that little girl's wise mother did. That's a great question, honey. Some stories are real, some stories are pretend, and some of the very best ones use a mix of both reality and make-believe to tell us something really important. What do you think about the Elijah story? The mother's answer didn't tell the little girl what to think, it invited her to think as a bona fide member of the interpretive community. Whenever we engage with the stories of the Bible, we become members of the interpretive community, and that's a big responsibility, especially when we remember how stories from the Bible have been used to promote both great good and great harm. We might say that good interpretation begins with three elements, science, art, and heart. First, we need critical or scientific research into history, language, anthropology, and sociology to wisely interpret the Bible. Second, since the Bible is a literary and therefore an artistic collection, we need an artist's eye and ear to wisely draw meaning from ancient stories. But at every step, we also must be guided by a humble, teachable heart that listens for the voice of the Spirit. In that light, the Elijah story addresses an urgent question. What happens when a great leader dies? Typically, a blaze of glory surrounds the hero's departure, symbolized by the fiery chariot and horses in the story. After the leader is gone, the actual life and message of the leader are forgotten obscured by the blaze of fame and glory. People become fans of the leader's reputation, but not followers of his example. That's why the old mentor Elijah puts his young apprentice Elisha through many trials and warns him about the spectacle surrounding his departure. The fireworks are not the point, Elijah explains. They're a distraction, a temptation to be overcome. If the apprentice resists that distraction and remains resolutely focused on the mentor himself, a double portion of the mentor's spirit will rest on him. We see something very similar in the story of Jesus' departure. Will his followers look up at the sky and speculate about their departed leader with uh, their heads in the clouds? Will they be fans of Jesus instead of followers of Jesus? Or will they get down to work and stay focused on living and sharing Jesus' down-to-earth way of life, empowered with his spirit? Like young Elisha, interpreters today must remember that it's easy to miss the point of ancient stories. Those stories didn't merely aim like a modern textbook to pass on factual information. They sought people's formation by engaging their interpretive imagination. That was what Jesus encountered centuries later. Many were still looking for fireworks in the form of a militant Messiah to swoop in someday, fix everything, and usher in Golden Age 2.0. They expected a warrior king to raise a revolutionary army, overthrow their oppressors, and restore civil law and religious order. In anticipation of the warrior king's arrival, some were sharpening their daggers and swords. But Jesus was living by a different interpretation of the old stories. So he refused to conform to their expectations. Instead of arming his followers with daggers, swords, spears, chariots, and war horses, he armed them with faith, hope, service, forgiveness, and love. 
when he healed people, he didn't tell them, I will save you or my faith will save you, but your faith has saved you. Working from a fresh interpretation of the past, he freed them from both passive, compliant, uh, passive pious complacency on the one hand and desperate violent action on the other. His fresh interpretation empowered them for something better, faithful, peaceful action. That's the kind of empowerment we need to face our huge challenges today. How will we deal with political and economic systems that are destroying the planet, privileging the super elite, and churning out weapons of unprecedented destruction at an unprecedented rate? How will we deal with religious systems that often have violent extremists on the one wing and complacent hypocrites on the other? How will we grapple with complex forces that break down family and community cohesion and leave vulnerable people at great risk, especially women and especially the very young and very old? How will we face our personal demons of greed, lust, anxiety, depression, anger, addiction, especially when people are spending billions to stimulate those demons so we will buy their products? These aren't pretend problems. To find real world solutions, we need to be wise interpreters of our past. Like Elijah's apprentice, Elisha, we must stay focused on the substance at the center, undistracted by all the surrounding fireworks. We need the spirit of Elijah, the spirit of Jesus, to be on us, in us, filling us, so we can show up with strength in a world falling apart. Amen.